Welcome back into The Nest. Drew and Barbara are on assignment and we'll be back next week for our show right before Thanksgiving break. Hi, my name is Kathy Ramirez, a sophomore in the Alma Academy here at Hoover High School. Today, we changed up The Nest a bit to bring you media projects produced this semester by my fellow students in the video production class. How do student athletes manage their time wisely between schoolwork and practices on a daily basis? Students who choose to play sports take up on responsibility into managing their time to be successful in class and on the court throughout the year. Good study habits such as eating healthy and getting adequate sleep all contribute to not only a prosperous school year, but also a victorious season. Does your coach do anything in order for his athletes to be able to succeed in the sport and in their classes? Yes, he comes and tells us to come to tutoring, finish our homework before we go to practice. And once he calls us over, we start doing running to be in condition for the season. Well, sometimes I have other things to do, but I have to come to play. You know? Well, sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's bad because I miss out on a lot of fun stuff. For a student athlete, maintaining balance between studies and sports can easily become overwhelming. But with certain strategies and keeping a positive mindset, a certain balance can be achieved and actually enhance the life of the student. It's really difficult, you know, just balancing yourself between sports and school, you know, but it's just part of being a student athlete. I usually have like a, a schedule and stuff like that, that I, you know, I work with and I manage throughout the week, so it just never puts me behind. Being a student athlete may have its disadvantages, but can overall help you to become more responsible, keep you active, and help you stay focused on what's important. Over the years, technology has slowly become a way for students to learn. Technology can benefit a student in many ways. Textbooks can be read on tablets, and answers can be searched for in an instant from both school and home. However, some students still argue that studying with textbooks is much more efficient than using technology. With technology, distractions on the screen and technical difficulties such as power and connectivity create problems. Students are so consumed with looking at their phones and looking at like social media when other people are posting and they forget about what's going on in front of them inside the classroom. You're relying on it being there and the answers being there so you don't actually do your work because the answers are there already. So it doesn't help you learn and keep them in your mind. Physical textbooks are still being used. However, most people overlook the problems of technology, preferring the easy accessibility of digital study. Technology makes a lot of information more accessible. Uh, you can just search things up or you can um, you know, copy paste things. Not to cheat, of course, but um, you know, just to find the information you're looking for. Uh, with a textbook, uh, it's just, you know, it'll take like five minutes to find what you're looking for. Uh, but with a computer or a phone, it's just five seconds and you're done. I think it's more efficient to study with technology because textbooks can't always give you what you need to know in life and textbooks only give you what they want you to learn. Technology and textbooks both have their own benefits. However, every student has their own way of studying. Are you an internet addict? Students around San Diego are constantly on the internet, checking social media, playing games, and watching videos. Do you think that spending too much time on the internet is good or bad? Can you become addicted to the internet like a person is addicted to drugs? I think a student who's addicted to the internet needs the same help that a student who's addicted to drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, any other kind of addiction because it affects the reward center of the brain. Uh, he used it three, three days a week. As for Pimmick Sweeney, counselor of Hoover High and Yadini, mother of two, spending too much time on the internet is like being addicted to drugs. A reasonable amount of time for internet use is two to three days per week. It's only bad if you're using it 24-7. I don't think students are addicted to the internet, but I do think they're very codependent on the internet. For the most part, probably not to the benefit of the class. I would say most of it's probably Facebook or other games, but um, it, they could be using it for school purposes, but I, I don't think they use it for school purposes. I want students to use the internet to learn how to research and um, make sure that everything they see they shouldn't believe and you should always question everything on the internet and use it responsibly. Internet addiction, something you heard every one of our interviewers talk about. 
Internet addiction is bad when used 24-7. Other than that, not all students are addicted to the internet, but co-dependent on the internet. The most students don't use the internet for the benefits of the class. Studies have shown that most students get six less hours of sleep each night as opposed to the eight to ten hours of sleep recommended. Not getting enough sleep can lead to falling asleep in class or not being as productive throughout the day. Many students aren't able to meet the recommended amount of sleep because they stay up late watching television or playing games. Sleeping schedules are ruined by staring at screens all night. The blue light projecting from your screen causes a hormone in your brain tricking it into thinking it's morning. I get like two to one hour of sleep every night since I sleep at 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. Um, I sleep that late because I procrastinate on homework and assignments that I'm supposed to do um, before that time and I also play games that late. Uh, sports affect my sleep because I get home at a later time than usually usual students do so like I usually take naps after I get home because I'm tired from practicing and all that. So then it takes away time because I do homework at a later time, which makes me to sleep later. When staring into screens, the hormone melatonin gets affected because your eyes are getting exposed to the light for an extended amount of time and later will cause harm to your body because it will also affect your sleep in the future. I think it has to do a lot with electronics. So I think it's not... Um, so falling asleep with the phone by them, there's actually EMF rays that will actually cause them to stay stimulated even if they're not using their phone. So putting it away early would be helpful. I believe they recommend that for every 20 minutes that you're looking at a screen, you spend at least a couple minutes looking at least 20 feet away. So like they call it 2020. And then that's going to help uh, your eyes uh, get better. And then it, it also is going to um, help them relax and be able to see better. Technology is something people heavily depend on for their lifestyle and their schoolwork, but it also messes with their heads. There is a way to prevent most of the blue light by downloading an app called Twilight. This app replaces the blue light with a red filter to prevent your brain from being fooled. It is important to get a good amount of sleep because that's how your brain gets the energy it needs to help you stay active throughout the day. A huge variety of food is available to eat in the city of San Diego. City Heights and North Park offers a diverse selection. You can satisfy your cravings by going into some of the popular restaurants around the neighborhood. Whether it's a burger with a side of fries or a bowl of pho, all of these foods express the culture within our community. Not only can you enjoy food at these restaurants, but you can also enjoy their different types of drinks and desserts. You can also eat your food with your family and friends to make your trip to any of these restaurants more enjoyable. City Heights and North Park are some of the great places in San Diego to find great quality restaurants with delicious food to eat. On the street Highland and Landis in City Heights, a community park called Highland and Landis Park is located there. Many people like bikers and skaters enjoy the benches, walkways, flowers, and the shade the trees located in the park provide. Kids have endless fun on the red structure surrounded by park. Diverse people enter the stairs that lead to the recreation center where a pool is located and many other things such as a tennis court. Soccer players and baseball players are allowed to play in the grassy fields where their families enjoy the paleteros and games. Dog owners are allowed to bring their pets to Rosa Parks to have some fun and precious bonding time. If you find yourself looking for a place to hang out, then consider going to the Highland and Landis Park. Located between 40th Street and Central Avenue stands Toralto Park. Two blocks away is Wilson Middle School. Every day, people go to or pass by Toralto on their way from school or work. Established over the freeway, Toralto acts as a bridge of green, connecting both sides of the neighborhood. Having a playground for small children, basketball courts for teens, and an extensive field, it is a relaxing haven for all ages. Families often gather there for parties or just for some fun time. With plenty of parking, it is all in all a good spot to hang out. In essence, Toronto is a beacon of stability and prominence in the City Heights community. Lots coming up on the calendar for Hoover, the big one, winter sports tryouts this Saturday. Wrestling meets at 8 a.m. on the track, boys soccer in the stadium starting at 9, girls basketball in the gym at 9, and boys basketball in the big gym starting at 2 Saturday afternoon. Today after school, be sure to check out the staff versus student flag football game at the stadium. On the academic side, November is a big month for CSU applications. Get to counseling for deadlines. Also, every Tuesday, join Ms. Tyler in the library for SAT prep and tutoring. 
The nest is almost two years old, but that does not mean you, the viewer, have seen all the stories. Now we go back into the archives for a story done eight years ago. Some people would consider this the border to paradise, a paradise where you are able to succeed based on your hard work. But for some people, it can be an opening to hell, where not only are they held back by environmental hazards, but by their fellow human neighbors pushing them back because they wish not to share the paradise they take for granted. Overcoming such obstacles such as 100 degree weather, dehydration, heat exhaustion, and even freezing temperatures may seem daunting for some, but for others, the risk of dying in pursuit of happiness is just an afterthought. In their minds, what really matters is saving their families from poverty. So what is an immigrant to do when having to face such deep and hard obstacles? Well, luckily for them, every paradise has its angels. When things look hopeless, where is an immigrant to look? Many immigrants coming through the countryside find help from the Border Angels, a nonprofit organization that gives out basic needs to help immigrants survive. Enrique Morones, head and founder of the Border Angels, is a devoted human rights activist. He has been featured on many major news shows that include CNN and NBC's Today Show. This is a program that I started back in 1986, and it was, um, I used to go down to Tijuana all the time and bring blankets and, and food, like a lot of people do to help our brothers and sisters. And this friend of mine said, hey Enrique, why don't you bring things to the migrants that live in San Diego? So we started going to the canyons and, and bringing food and water to them back in 1986, and it was to help our brothers and sisters because we're all the same race, the human race, and we thought it was important to do that. This wall has caused more than 10,000 deaths. It's very sad. So that's why we started Border Angels, and we've just grown and grown since we started back in 1986. Border Angels, our, our mission statement is very clear. If I was hungry, did you give me to eat? If I was thirsty, did you give me to drink? That comes from uh, Matthew, from the book of Matthew 25, 35. And that's our mission statement, that, you know, let's help our fellow man. Help our fellow man, and, and it, it, I don't care what country they're from or what their economic level, we're all human beings and that's what we're trying to do, help our fellow man. We started here in San Diego and then we started going to the East County, North County, Tijuana, Baja California. We also have gone into Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, along the 10 state border area. But we don't only put water out there, we also visit the migrants that live in the canyons. We also do events like we did today to remember the, the deaths on the border. Last year in February, we went from San Diego to Washington, D.C., and we asked people to take to the streets and march. March against 4437, and you saw that three and a half million people marched. So we're all over the country. Well, I think it's important to help our fellow man. We're all of the same race, the human race, and it's important that we practice what we preach about loving our neighbor. These are our brothers and sisters, and it's important that we try to help out our fellow man, and each one of us can make a big difference. I believe that the person that's gonna make the big difference is that person that you see in the mirror every morning. You don't have to wait for a big name like Cesar Chavez or Mother Teresa. They were ordinary people that did extraordinary things, but each one of us can make a big difference. If each one of us does, our, does, you know, does a little bit, this will, this will make this a better world. That's the way that I think we can make a difference, by saving one person at a time. Well, the future goals is that we won't have to continue to do this in the future, because if we do tear down this wall, if we do treat our neighbors with dignity and respect, if we do build bridges of communication instead of triple fences of separation, this will be a better world. Thank you for letting me suffer the nest this week. Have a great Wednesday.